In 1985, Jack published The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Since then, the book has gone on to become an underground phenomenon, selling more than 600,000 copies worldwide and is now in its 11th edition. The first populist book of its kind, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, is part scientific document, part journalistic expose, and part holy crusade. It takes us on a journey of discovery that provides a caustic, sarcastic, and often irreverent look at the forgotten history and economic potential of the hemp plant. Written in simple and scholarly detail, its pages are filled with numerous articles, historical documents, photographs, and diagrams, along with the writings of poets, philosophers, and of course, the emperor himself. We learn of the thousands of commercial and therapeutic uses of hemp, and how hemp has been a significant part of our spiritual and cultural heritage throughout the ages. We discover how the hemp seed could again become a basic world food, and how no other single plant seed contains virtually all the nutritional elements necessary to maintain healthy human life. The Emperor Wears No Clothes explores in great detail Jack's most passionate beliefs that biomass fuels derived from hemp can provide virtually all of the world's energy needs, eliminating the global dependence on our nearly depleted fossil fuels. That the systematic destruction of our environment can be dramatically reduced or even stopped by using hemp as the resource for fiber, fuel, and paper. The book makes the case for hemp as the world's savior, and Jack backs it up with a $50,000 offer to anyone who can prove him wrong. So far, he's had no takers. The full reasons behind marijuana prohibition are still being debated. Some experts think racism played a part. So that when poor people, immigrants, take the drugs, we're afraid they're going to rise up, smite, steal, and take the white women. And so we outlaw the drugs because of our fears over that. Others think Harry Anslinger was motivated by ambition and power. A great deal of the reason that marijuana was prohibited was because of self-aggrandizement at the federal level, especially with Harry Anslinger wanting to be the J. Edgar Hoover of his own agency. Jack sees darker motives. His book alleges a high-level conspiracy revolving around Anslinger, Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, the DuPont Chemical Company, and hemp. Before the Civil War, hemp was the nation's second largest cash crop behind cotton. But while cotton could be processed by machine, slaves were the only cost-effective way to separate the tough hemp fiber from the pulpy core that was used to make paper. When slavery ended after the war, the hemp industry went into decline. The death knell was sounded in the late 1800s when paper makers converted to tree-based pulp. It meant that uh, you could chop down a forest a lot cheaper than you could pay laborers to manufacture hemp fiber for paper. Jack hangs his conspiracy angle on events that happened simultaneously with marijuana prohibition. Coincidence number one. A German immigrant invented a machine called the decorticator. This new mechanical processing device was about to bring hemp into the modern industrial age. Popular Mechanics magazine recognized the potential bonanza for American farmers and entrepreneurs. This article heralded a machine that could process hemp quickly and cheaply for the first time in history. Coincidence number two. The DuPont Company in the 30s came out with both a sulfuric acid method for making paper from trees 
and a new invention called plastic. Jack's book points out that a hemp resurgence would certainly have been a serious threat to DuPont's petrochemical strategies. And finally, there's millionaire financier Andrew Mellon. Mellon was Anslinger's boss, Harry's wife's uncle, and DuPont's banker. Coincidences number three, four, and five. Don't smoke The book's credibility got a boost from Jack's discovery of this 14-minute documentary. Supposedly made by the U.S. government five years after the Marijuana Tax Act. Its purpose was to encourage farmers to grow outlawed hemp during World War II. Long ago, when these ancient Grecian temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years, even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. But now, with Philippine and East Indian sources of hemp in the hands of the Japanese, and shipment of jute from India curtailed, American hemp must meet the needs of our Army and Navy, as well as of our industries. In 1942, patriotic farmers, at the government's request, planted 36,000 acres of seed hemp, an increase of several thousand percent. The goal for 1943 is 50,000 acres of seed hemp. For to grow hemp legally, you must have a federal registration and tax stamp. This is provided for in your contract. Ask your AAA committee man or your county agent about it. Don't forget. Jack often staged public showings of hemp for victory to validate his history of the plant. He also used the film as an example of government deception and hypocrisy. But he was stunned one day in 1988 to get a call from a newspaper reporter questioning the authenticity of the film. Well, Mr. Hare, we went out to check the information and um, we found nobody that would corroborate your story that um, this movie was even ever made. Uh, you said this movie was made by the United States government, this movie Hemp for Victory. That if there would be any evidence that the government ever made such a film. It would be in the Library of Congress, it would be in the Department of Agriculture. It is in neither place. His reputation on the line, Jack and his friends went on an excursion to Washington, D.C. We were just determined to find the documentation that made it a credible a government movie made by the U.S. government and not made by Jack. We didn't see it as detective work. We just saw it as we were on a mission. We're on a mission from God. <laughs> Many others before Jack had searched the Library of Congress for proof of the documentary's existence and found none. In a day of digging, Jack ran into the same lack of evidence. After deciding to give up, we decided to give it one more try. In a dusty old book, hidden among clutter in a back room, they found it. The official Library of Congress documentation. Indeed, the film had been made by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Hemp for victory. <laughs> 